Okay, so Ezra Nehemiah, this is the class, Let Us Rise Up and Build. We're in the third lesson, encouraged and led by God's champion. So I want to begin by reviewing a little bit of what's happened so far. And I want us to focus on the main characters of this story. And also take a look at the qualities that they displayed that made them great leaders. Uh, and um, a couple of lessons uh, that their lives uh, can teach us today. So there's the uh, outline of what we're going to do. So we're going to begin with a little review of uh, the events. Uh, 587 BC, 587 BC, the small kingdom of Judah, known as the Southern Kingdom, is overthrown by the Babylonian army. And most of the leaders and citizens remaining in Jerusalem are taken into captivity and they are returned to Babylon. And they are there for approximately 70 years. And during their exile, they multiply in number and they prosper. Um, in the meantime, the Babylonian kingdom itself is conquered by the Medo-Persian empire and a new king is established. 538 BC, during the reign of the Persian king Cyrus, a law or an edict is passed that permits the Jews in captivity to return to Jerusalem to rebuild their homes and their cities, the temple and the city of Jerusalem itself. Uh, I've told you that this process takes approximately 100 years and it includes a series of leaders who each had a hand in rebuilding and reestablishing the city and the temple and of course its uh, society. So it's not just that you know, 70 years were up, whoops, everybody that's uh, exiled in, 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 in Babylon, everybody together, we all go back at the same, it didn't work that way. They came back in groups. There was a first group that came back, a second group that came back, a third group that came back over a period of about 100 years. The characters involved, so that if you understand that idea that there were several returns, if you wish, uh, it makes a little more sense when we look at all the characters that are involved. So first character uh, is uh, Sheshbazar. Sheshbazar, uh, his name means Prince of Judah, 538 BC. Some scholars think that this is another name for Zerubbabel, but the common opinion is that he was uh, the one that uh, Cyrus made governor of uh, Judah. We read about that in Ezra. Now the king originally entrusted the temple vessels to this man for return to Jerusalem. Uh, and these things were priceless. These vessels here made of gold and silver and so on and so forth, very precious. Um, he was in the first wave of returnees and he was responsible for laying the foundation of the temple, but he didn't complete it. That's uh, uh, Shesh Bazaar. He was also the governor who uh, did not permit certain families to participate in the sacrifice of the temple until their own ancestry could be, could be proven. Uh, another character, is Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel means a seed of Babylon, seed of Babylon, 516 BC. He was a descendant of the former king of Judah, Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim. He was part of the original group that came with Sheshbazar, who may have been his uncle. Uh, he helped in the laying of the foundation of the temple, which was stopped for a while because of the opposition of their enemies. And in 520 BC, he and Jeshua began again the work on the temple and this time they completed it. Haggai uh, refers to him, refers to Zerubbabel as the governor of Judah, uh, a post he may have held after Sheshbazar. Another character is uh, Jeshua. Jeshua means uh, the Lord is salvation. Now Ezra and Nehemiah refer to this person as Jeshua and the prophets Haggai and Zechariah call him Joshua, but it's the, same, it's the same person. He served as the high priest during the restoration of the city and its temple in Jerusalem. He built the altar and he renewed the offering of sacrifices as the beginning of worship in, uh, in Jerusalem. The temple wasn't built yet, 
they, they rebuilt, they laid the foundation and they rebuilt the altar first. And as soon as the altar was built, they began offering sacrifice, even before the walls and the rest of the structure uh, was built. Another character, Haggai, 538 to 520 BC, uh, he arrived uh, in 538, but he begins his prophetic ministry much later in 520 BC. He was a prophet who spoke to the leaders of the restoration effort. Since he is first mentioned by Ezra in the period of 520 BC, it's supposed that he came back to Jerusalem as a child in the first group and then uh, around 537, and then he grew up during the work of the restoration. Uh, if this is correct, then he would have witnessed firsthand how the work of rebuilding the temple was opposed and eventually stopped as the people turned their attention to rebuilding their personal homes and personal, you know, they started rebuilding the temple and then they, they ran into some opposition, they stopped that and they figured, well, we might as well build our houses and business and get on with, uh, get on with life. His uh, book, Haggai, his book, uh, contains four prophecies that included first a rebuke to the people for having abandoned uh, the uh, rebuilding of the temple. Second, a word of comfort for the people who mourned the loss of the original temple and its splendor. It's amazing, you read in uh, one of the books there that the older people who came back who remembered what, the, what, the, what Solomon's temple looked like, they remembered that. And then of course it was destroyed by the Babylonians and they were old enough, they came back and, 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 and now they started rebuilding the new temple that was not the same glory, you know, not the same thing. It wasn't built uh, along the same, uh, with all the same materials as the original temple was. And uh, you read about how they mourned, uh, you know, what they, had, uh, what they had lost, very interesting. And Haggai offers a word of comfort also, he gives a teaching about the ritual purity, showing how the new temple will remove the uncleanness left by the desecration of the old temple. And so he establishes spiritual legitimacy of the new temple, Haggai with his preaching and promises. Also, he makes a promise to Zerubbabel that he would be kept safe despite problems and disturbances in the Persian empire which he relied on to do his work. They were always working and you know, in a hurry and they had local enemies around them while they were building and rebuilding. But at the same time, they kept an eye on what was going on uh, back in uh, Babylon or in Persia because uh, you know, the, the inner workings of the, you know, the politics there, who was in and who was out affected them. If their guys were, were in, well, they could c continue to work you know, in peace and keep going and building. If their guys were out, it's like lobbyists in Washington. You know, if your guys are in, if your party is in and they've got the power, well, then you can do your business. If your party is out of power, uh, well, then you may have some problems. You know, well, it was the kind of the same, uh, it was the same thing. And so the thing about Haggai is that he prophesied to Zerubbabel, keep working, keep doing it, don't worry about it, the Lord will take care of you, and so on and so forth. That was a part of his role. Another individual uh, that we meet is Zechariah. Zechariah means uh, remember God. 520 BC, when he begins his prophecy, so you see that some of these prophets, they, they overlap. It's not, a, it's not a, a, a very, you know, a clean line one after the other. They tend to overlap um, in, in history. Uh, Zechariah was the other prophet of this time period who, like Haggai, is believed to have arrived with the first group and grew up as the rebuilding was uh, begun. Both he and Haggai were relatively young men who served as God's prophets during a critical time in their nation's uh, history. Today we would say they grew up in the church. You know, you have some young men here growing up in the church and we watch them the ver very first day they get up and they, you know, they're nine or 10 years old or something, they lead a prayer or perhaps they read out of the book, you know, like some of our young guys do, they have to put a little stool down to get up, you know, to get, you know, straight with the microphone. Well, Haggai, Zechariah, you know, they grew up in the church. They grew up while the temple was being built and so on and so forth. And God called them into ministry uh, when they uh, became uh, young uh, men. 
Um, his uh, main prophet, Zechariah, his main prophecy between 520 and 518 BC as the temple is being rebuilt, uh, they include a series of visions that promote the idea that the rebuilding of the temple and those who serve are there part of God's plan to eventually bring the Messiah and salvation to the world. So he's a, you know, what we call a minor prophet. Uh, he doesn't have a, you know, a lot to say that we, we read about, but what he does say is very critical, you know, telling these people in real time, what you're doing now, you know, what you're doing now serves God's purpose uh, in bringing the Messiah uh, to the world. And so this uh, uh, was very motivating to the people then, for the people who thought, ah, is this really worth it? Boy, this temple is not going to be as glorious as the original one. And, you know, people are against this. So, you know, is this, is this really worth it? And Zechariah was there sent by God to tell them, oh yes, it's worth it. You know, you, you, are, you are a chain, a link in this chain that will eventually uh, bring, the, uh, bring the Messiah. So these names, you know, Sheshbazar, Zerubbabel, Jeshua, they don't just roll off our tongues, you know, as far as Bible characters are concerned. So I thought maybe I'd give you a little background about these guys. And then we have, okay, now Ezra. Oh boy, Ezra, we know a little bit about Ezra, right? Ezra means, uh, to help, to help, 457 BC. So Ezra was sent to Jerusalem by the Persian king Artaxerxes I in 458, 457 BC. This was now roughly 80 years after the first wave of Jews had returned. During this time, the physical rebuilding of the city and the temple have been completed and a regular worship has been reinstated. His task, Ezra, his task as an expert teacher of the law was to enforce universal observance of Jewish law and appoint qualified people to serve in the temple. Very nice, you know, we build a nice big church building and you know, we have a big church building, an auditorium, we have a you know, fellowship hall, we have a gym, we have parking, we have all kinds of rooms and so on and so forth. But I mean, unless you have some ministers and some deacons and some elders you know, to, to direct and, and, and to get the work going and, and to serve the congregation, it's just a building. Well, it was just a temple, uh, people had to be assigned and of course the Mosaic law, the law that governed the offering of sacrifices and so on and so forth was very complex. You just couldn't go in and do whatever you wanted. There was a procedure that needed to be followed. And Ezra was called and sent in order to train the people to do this type of work. In his book, we note that he brings with him not only priests and Levites to serve, but he also brings gifts from the king and the people to provide support for the worship and the teaching that was taking place at the temple. They needed things, they needed supplies. And so he brings those supplies with him. Um, Ezra probably returned to Babylon to report to the king concerning his, uh, concerning his mission. In 444 BC, we see him back in Jerusalem again, this time for the dedication of the newly built wall around the city that was completed by Nehemiah. First they went and they put in the foundation and the altar, then uh, they put up the walls, they finished the temple, uh, then they finished rebuilding the city and the cities around them and the businesses and so on and so forth. And then the very last thing construction wise uh, was the actual wall that was around uh, cities, uh, major cities uh, in those times uh, had walls uh, for uh, protection. Um, let's see, uh, in Nehemiah chapter 12, we read that Nehemiah led one procession around the wall and Ezra led a second group and, uh, and met, you know, one started on this side and this side they went, you know, they went this way, they went around the wall and then they met here and they did this to dedicate the, uh, the wall uh, once, it was, uh, once it was completed, that was, uh, that was Ezra. Another name that we uh, recognize, Nehemiah, right? Nehemiah means uh, God comforts, God comforts. 445 uh, BC, 
Nehemiah is probably the most familiar character because his book reads like a historical narrative. He is a, a cupbearer uh, to the king, like a, like a, a, a consultant, if you wish, uh, to the Persian king Artaxerxes, and he's given permission to return to Jerusalem in order to rebuild the protective wall around the city. He is named governor in 445, and he's sent along with supplies to complete the task of rebuilding the wall. Now, despite fierce opposition, we will read, Despite fierce opposition, he completes the building of the wall in 52 days. And then he returns to Babylon after this uh, construction, but he is forced to come back to Jerusalem in order to resolve disputes and make needed reforms. Nehemiah, along with Ezra, tried not only to reestablish proper worship, but also they worked hard to reestablish order in the rebuilt Jewish society of that, uh, of that day. And so these are the main characters who we read about in the period of the rebuilding of the city and the temple and the walls of Jerusalem. They're also key leaders whose lives and actions teach us a lot about leadership, uh, leadership today. So we learned that key leaders bring something special to the table. God stirred up many people among the Jews when they returned to Jerusalem uh, when uh, it was being prepared. But certain ones among the Jews were chosen by a succession of pagan kings to actually lead the effort to repatriate the Jewish people to their, to their homeland. I believe it's because each of these men brought something special to the table, certain qualities that were obvious even to those who were not Jews and were not followers of their God. Even pagan kings recognized that there's something special about Ezra, that there was something special about Sheshbazar and, and Zerubbabel. You know, there was something special about these guys and they were chosen uh, to do a task. It's one thing if a, a, another Jew chooses you, but if a pagan king chooses you, uh, that's amazing. Uh, that means he really uh, is able to see something outstanding in your uh, uh, character. So these pagan kings, you know, Cyrus, Artaxerxes, and Darius, they saw something special in these men that transcended culture and position and religion. As leaders themselves, they recognized the special qualities that these Jewish men had that would enable them to carry out the task. So as we read about each of these leaders in Ezra and Nehemiah and then the prophets, we catch a glimpse of what these ancient kings first saw in them. And in the rest of my lesson, I'd like to share some of these with you. So we'll go back over them, shall we? Let's start with Sheshbazar. The thing about Sheshbazar is he was trustworthy. He's not mentioned often, but in Ezra 1 verse 8, we see the king's treasurer count out a fortune in temple vessels into his care. He's the one who is responsible for not only the vessels, but also the money given to start the rebuilding and the relocation of the people and also serve as governor. We don't know if he had political influence and talent at organizing or personal wealth or knowledge of the scriptures as a teacher. We don't know that. All we know is that he was worthy of the king's trust and apparently also had the people's confidence because they accepted him as a leader. The first ingredient in any new venture, any project that requires faith and sacrifice from people is confidence. Confidence in the leadership, no matter what it is. We're starting a new something, a new project, and so-and-so has been named to head up the project. Well, many times that project, the success or failure of that project depends largely on who has been you know, charged with you know, leading it. People say, oh yeah, I can get behind that guy, or I can work with that, with that sister. And so Shesh Bazar was, this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, man. You may have a dream and, a, and an action plan. You may be able to make uh, convincing and well-documented presentations, but in the end, people make their decisions about what you dream based on who you are in reality. The king was moved by God to free the Jews and send them home, 
but the plan only went into action when he could find a man he could trust. A man he could trust, a woman you can trust. That's always the beginning. We look at Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, his main quality that we see is perseverance. We have more detail about Nehemiah building the wall around Jerusalem, but the true building feat belongs to Zerubbabel. He may have come with Sheshbazar as a boy and participated in the general rebuilding of the city and the laying of the basic foundation of the temple. In time, he took a leadership role in this and he was the focus of attack when he refused to allow the neighboring peoples to help in building the temple. He was the one that said, nope, you can't help us. You have no business here. You people have no business here. And that's what started all the trouble. Political pressure eventually stopped the work for over a decade, but Zerubbabel was encouraged to continue despite political pressure and eventually completed the building of the temple four years later. A true leader's keenest insight is that no matter what the task, there will always be obstacles. If you have a leader who, who just falls apart at the first obstacle, that's not much of a leader. Zerubbabel's task could not have been more inspiring to rebuild the temple where God dwells. Talk about motivation if you're a Jew. He was sure that his project was right and good and noble. He was sure that what he was doing was the will of God. But he faced opposition from his neighbors, apathy from his people, interference from his political masters. It was unkind, it was unfair, it was unspiritual, it was dangerous. Why would God give a leader a task and then allow so many trials and obstacles? I think parents ask themselves that question every day, don't you? <laughs> Why would God give a leader a task and then allow so many problems? Perhaps it's because God is more interested in completing the person than the person completing the task. Maybe that's why. Paul says in Romans 5, 3 and 4, but we also exult in our tribulations knowing that tribulations bring about perseverance and perseverance, proven character and proven character, hope. Zerubbabel was building God's physical temple in Jerusalem while God was building his spiritual temple in Zerubbabel. Leaders need to understand that followers don't do what leaders say. They do what leaders do. That's the golden rule, brothers and sisters. The kings and people provided all the money and all the resources necessary to rebuild the temple, but in the end, it was Zerubbabel's perseverance that finished the job. Another character, quickly here, Jeshua, Haggai, Zechariah, and their visions. I grouped these men together even if one was a high priest and the others were prophets because they shared the same trait. They had vision. In Jeshua's case, it was the vision of the end at the beginning. Do you understand what I'm saying? He, he saw the end right from the start. Hasn't that ever happened to you? You, you, you see something and you, you see in your mind's eye exactly what it's going to be, but you're only at step one. And the hard part is to get people you know, to see the vision that you see. All they see is step number one. They don't see step two, three, four, all the way to 10. A lot of times that's how it works. Somebody sees step 10, the completion, <laughs> and is at step one. Uh, that's where these people were. They saw the completion, they saw the glory, they saw the purpose, they saw the, the reason and the goodness that would come from all of this. And they spoke about it and, and preached about it. In Jeshua's case, it was the vision of the end at the beginning. He didn't wait until the entire temple was rebuilt and dedicated and functional before he began to minister. He replaced the central object of his ministry, which was the altar, and he began immediately offering sacrifice and ongoing worship for the people. Spiritual vision enables God's leaders to use what they have in hand, even if it's not all of what they see with the eye of faith. I want to tell you, a lot of ministries, a lot of missions would never happen if people waited around till they had all the things they needed you know, to complete it right at the beginning. Sometimes 
The only thing that God gives you is step one and step 10. And you say to him, well, God, what about step two? I'll provide, he said. I'll provide. You take step one, I'll, I'll let you know what step two is. And when you've taken step two, I'll show you what step three is. And the thing that keeps you moving is you see step 10, you know it's there. Well, these men were like that. They saw the end at the beginning. Spiritual vision enables God's leaders to use what they have at hand, as I said, even if it's not all uh, that they see with the eyes of faith. Vision is what gets us started. Perseverance is what gets us finished. This is why Jeshua, Zerubbabel, they made a good team. Haggai and Zechariah's vision had the added element of courage. They were not afraid to both rebuke the people and encourage them to work when this was not a popular thing to do. Both prophets spoke of the future and what the rebuilding would eventually accomplish in God's plan for his people. This was not an easy message at a time when the people were uh, unmotivated, uh, the enemies were threatening and their support from the king you know, wasn't very sure. It's easy to be a prophet when there's no risk. Uh, it's easy then. But men with vision are not afraid to speak God's truth even when it's unpopular, even when it's inconvenient. Their vision of God's will and purpose kept the task on its proper course until it was completed. And so leaders need to have a vision of not only the end and the beginning, they need to see the course set for their followers so they can lead during every step of the way. Next character is Ezra. Ezra had credibility, oh boy, yes. Ezra had credibility. He was a professional scribe. It says in Ezra 7, 6. In the Old Testament, scribes were the true scholars who supervised the copying of the law. His task was to reestablish the professional class of religious workers. Now there weren't only priests and rabbis, there were magistrates and judges and so on and so forth, you know, that managed the affairs of the people. Not everybody you know, in the whole land just could come to the high priest to get a decision about something, a land dispute or inheritance thing. They had magistrates and judges. He went to train those uh, people. He was well trained himself and had great ability as well as the highest level of judicial authority. He could impose the death penalty, Ezra 7 uh, verse uh, 26, I believe. That's a lot of power for a Jewish, for a Jewish leader. But what gave him utmost credibility as a religious leader was not his knowledge or his training or even his authority, it was his piety. That's what gave him authority, his piety. You know, we don't use this word much anymore, but it's an extremely important spiritual quality, especially for leaders. Piety is respect for the people and the things of God. That's what piety is. Ezra had the utmost respect for the word of God and for God's people. In Ezra 7 verse 10 it says, for Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to practice it and to teach his statutes and ordinances in Israel. It was because of this extreme piety that Ezra had credibility with the king and led the king to grant him such extraordinary power and authority. And Ezra did not disappoint. Once arrived in Jerusalem, he set out to organize Jewish society according to God's word. He taught the word, he established a religious hierarchy that was to rule the people. We uh, read of uh, revolutionaries and uh, rejection of some of the leaders in Jerusalem, but not of Ezra. People never, never rose up against Ezra. He was accepted by the people and the Jewish leaders as well as the king because he had credibility in all of their eyes. He was not only a teacher of the law, but his deep piety confirmed that he placed no greater burden on anyone else than he was willing himself to carry. Isn't that what you want to see in a leader? Uh, every time I uh, watch uh, uh, movies or stories or, you know, about military, uh, the greatest leaders, the ones that 
the, the men, the soldiers uh, are willing to, fo to, to, to follow you know, into almost sure death are, are, are those individuals, those leaders, those captains, those sergeants who will do everything that the men will do. Those leaders who don't lead from behind. They lead, you know, leadership is in front, not in back. Those are the leaders that gain the respect of uh, human beings. Those are the leaders that people will sacrifice for. In the end, our leaders inspire us to believe in their leadership because their lives offer us a credible witness that they are worthy of our allegiance. Somebody who risks their life for me, somebody who's willing to suffer the same thing I suffer in order to achieve the goal, that person I'm going to follow without question. Another character, Nehemiah. Nehemiah, I could say a lot about Nehemiah and what he brought to the table as a leader. Uh, organizational skills, the way he organized the actual building of the wall itself, getting all the people involved in one way or another. He had courage, the fact that he didn't allow his enemy, uh, their threats to stop him on his mission. Uh, inspiration, we read of the way that he encouraged everyone to keep working even in the darkest hour. And of course he had zeal for the Lord, how he came back and reinstated proper conduct when the people were falling away from the Lord. But if I were to pick one outstanding characteristic as God's leader, as God's champion, it would be his humility, his humility. Not many people equate humility with leadership. We see our leaders as bold, decisive, well-organized, multi-talented, but not usually as humble. This is because we don't understand what spiritual humility is. We sometimes equate humility with shyness or quietness or being self-effacing or softness. However, true humility is the absence of self-will. A humble person is one who does not have to have his own way all the time. A humble person does not crave to be seen, to be first, to be right all the time, to be honored or to be praised. In a spiritual sense, a humble person seeks to know and do God's will rather than their will. This effort to know and do God's will creates patience and wisdom, meekness, stillness of spirit, all signs of a person's humble character. You know, a leader is humble because he is willing to wait on the Lord to know a course of action before beginning. You know that a leader is humble if he is more eager to give praise than to receive it. You know that a leader is humble if he is more aware of his own weakness than your weakness. Nehemiah was this kind of leader and his humility is evident at the very beginning of his book. After he has, burden, after he has the burden for his people placed on his heart, and praying fervently to God, confessing his own and his people's sins, he does an extraordinary thing. He waits. The people come from Jerusalem saying, man, things are bad there, the wall is down, we're in trouble, oh dear, we're gonna die, you know? And, and, and so we see Nehemiah, he goes into prayer on behalf of the people. Well, what will they do? Lord, you know, I wanna do something, you know? And what does he do? Then he stops praying and he just, he waits. He prays in the, it says, he prays in the ninth month of Kislev. And only in the month of Nisan, which is the first month, nearly four months later, does God begin to work out his plan. He hears nothing, he prays to God, he hears nothing for four months. Humility enabled him to wait on the Lord and then step out in faith in approaching the king. It doesn't matter what other skills you bring to the table in serving God, without humility, without courage, uh, expertise or zeal, all of these things will be wasted if you don't have humility. All of the Lord's uh, leaders have to first realize that their leadership is given and directed by God, not themselves. That's why in the church, 
nobody appoints them, like nobody says, you know what, today, today's a good day, I'm feeling good, I think I'm going to appoint myself as being a deacon. You know, I know how to do the job, so I'm going to appoint myself as deacon. Or, you know, I've been here, I've been here for 30 years in this church. I believe, I think I'm going to appoint myself as one of the elders. I know you're smiling because you realize it's not the way it works. No, no one, everyone is appointed. Well, in the same way in God's kingdom, everyone is appointed. Leaders are appointed. They don't appoint themselves. Nehemiah succeeded as a leader, not because he brought many leadership skills to the table. He succeeded because his humility enabled him to see how God wanted him to use his skills. That's why he succeeded. And so every person here today who has been called out for leadership in God's kingdom in one way or another needs to remember two things taught to us by the leaders that we have studied today. Number one, we don't need to have all of the gifts mentioned to lead God's people. We simply have to place the talents that we do have at God's disposal. So many people do not rise to lead God's people because they're waiting for more experience, they're waiting for more talent, they're waiting for more ability, and their time never comes. But God is able to make a great leader out of those who surrender whatever small abilities they have to His will and to His purpose. That's how that works. And then secondly, what is missing in this world is not great dreams or missions, it's great leaders. God is always looking for great leaders in order to do great things for the kingdom of God. God is always building his church, always looking for those who will step up and step out to do his work. The question that begs to be asked today is this, are the leaders of God's people only to be found in the pages of Ezra and Nehemiah or can they be found in this room here today? Remember this, before the people can ever rise up to build, leaders must first rise up who will be able to inspire them to greatness. That's the lesson that Ezra and Nehemiah teaches us about leadership. Okay, that's the lesson for this morning. We're dismissed, thank you. <laughs>